Firstly, I'd love to welcome you to um, the launch of the Inside Story. Um, it's great to be in this venue uh, that is uh, many, many years older than myself and the people who are, uh, we're going to be speaking with this evening. The Inside Story, um, it's a show, it's a channel, uh, it's a new channel that, uh, that aims to seek to speak uh, into the big questions of life, um, cultivating compelling monthly conversations with people from across the world. So we're delighted tonight um, to be uh, welcomed by world-leading scientists and uh, thought leaders um, to be uh, graced on the topic, Is There a God? And before we uh, get into the conversation, um, which will take place here, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Freud for their hospitality this evening. If we could give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. These conversations are going to be ranging from uh, speaking with world-leading academics, uh, thought leaders across the world, uh, sports stars, celebrities, uh, and people who have um, extremely compelling stories and inspirational people who've uh, achieved many great feats. So we're looking forward tonight um, to be welcoming Peter Atkins, Dr. Peter Atkins, and Dr. Jonathan McClatchy um, to join us in this conversation, which really is a big question in life. The location of these uh, conversations is going to change. Um, that tonight we're blessed to be um, in the home of Academia, Oxford, and uh, at this amazing venue that has stood here uh, since 1836, if I'm correct. Uh, if I'm wrong, just do heckle at the back. Um, it, was a, it was a church, and then more recently has become a bar um, in, in, in 18, uh, 1960, I believe. So we want to be in very specific, unique locations uh, and have these conversations that are going to impact the people watching. We'd like to welcome everyone to this conversation. This isn't just for um, atheists or theists or agnostics or whoever else uh, wants to be in that group. This is for everyone, and uh, we want everyone to feel welcome and um, feel that they can be part of the conversation. You're all welcome. If you don't feel welcome, then please have a word with me afterwards. But as a, as a mark of welcome for myself, please feel welcome. I might say welcome again another time in the evening, just, just, for, the, uh, just for the fun of it. Um, the format of the evening is going to be quite simple. We're going to have a conversation for around an hour. We're then going to have a short break and then a time of Q&A, at which I'd love you to be uh, sending in your questions um, for these two gentlemen. We have a number of questions that have already uh, been sent in prior, um, but it would be great to have some input from the audience. So um, if you see those cards on your table, um, on those cards are um, social media links and um, the hashtag. If you'd like to tweet or send a question in through Instagram, feel free to do that, um, and then we will be logging that and uh, asking those later on in the Q&A. Finally, I'd like to uh, just welcome Dr. Peter Atkins and Jonathan McClatchy to the stage. Please, let's have a round of applause. So before we start, um, can I just have a hand, uh, show of hands? Who would call themselves an atheist in the room? Feel free, don't be shy. Okay, we've got one or two over here, great. And who would call themselves a theist in the room? Um, and who would call themselves an agnostic in the room? Well, I think from, you can both tell that we've got a good mix of people in the room. And um, unlike many other conversations, I think it's, uh, it's a real true statement to the location of where we are um, to have this uh, breadth of people in the room. So welcome again, got it in there again. Okay, firstly, guys, um, before we um, move forward, um, it would be great um, if you could just share a bit um, about some, um, some, of your, some of the things that are behind the qualifications. Um, Dr. Uh, Atkins, we talked a bit briefly over dinner um, about um, your remarkable qualifications and the work that you've done up to now, but I wonder if you could share a bit about um, the, um, the person behind the chemistry. Um, if, if you could. Oh dear, what a challenge. I don't think there is much of a person behind the chemistry, actually. <laughs> and um, uh, in, in terms of where I come from, I think I came from a childhood when I was sent to church by my parents simply to clear the house out for in, on Sunday mornings. Um, but when I got to university and I discovered that it was possible to think for yourself then all 
uh, belief in the supernatural, by which, of course, I mean religion, um, sort of dripped off me. And that was reinforced by my discovery of science as um, a mode of thinking of which humanity should be extraordinarily proud of discovering, a, a, a mode of thinking and a mode of discovery that answers all the great questions of being without exception. So um, uh, ever since I started to think and discovered science and the power that it brings to the human intellect acting collectively, uh, the more I have come effectively to despise the uh, despise religion in all its forms. Is that what you want? That's helpful. Um, what I was uh, also looking at as well, um, thinking you could maybe expand on, and um, Peter is, um, you grew up, um, you grew up in a Christian family. You mentioned. Well, not really a Christian family. It's a family that didn't want children in the house on Sunday mornings, which I think might count as a Church of England Christian family. Wow. And, and were, your parents, um, were your parents of faith? Did they have faith? Not in the least. I mean, they didn't have the education to realise that they were at least agnostics and probably atheists. There was a kind of hint of scepticism in, in what I remember of what little conversation they actually had together. Um, but, um, no, it, it, we're speaking now of the 1940s um, uh, and... Yeah, the 1940s, when everyone sort of half believed, and very few people could not admit to not believing. That's that's very interesting. Thank you for, for sharing that. And in terms of if, if someone was to if someone was to ask you, what do we need to know about Dr. Atkins um, apart from chemistry? What would what would be the words that you would you would give them? What would you share with them? Oh, the love of science and the realisation that science is the one mode of discovery that humans have stumbled upon in their bumbling way, but it turns out to be without bounds in its ability to bring comprehension to mankind and womankind. Well, so in terms, of, um, in terms of things that you would do um, for enjoyment, obviously science is one of those, but outside of that, you know, is travel something that's of interest to you? Oh, I think you won't get down to nitty-gritty like that. Oh, we like um, the detail. We like oh, yeah. the detail. Um, I like reading. I mean, everyone should read. Um, I like travel. Everyone should travel. Um, I, I like certain kinds of music. Not all kinds of music. Can you give us your favourite song? Hmm? Can you give, share with us your favourite song? No. No. Uh, <laughs> well, may, if, if anyone wants to ask that in the Q&A, don't bother. Yeah. Um, but, um, um, wow. Yeah, uh, so I just have the, the usual pastimes of a sort of academic intellectual. Well, thank you for sharing that. Well, yeah. more, more to follow. Uh, we've got a good few minutes uh, ahead of us. So, um, Dr. McClatchy, maybe you could uh, address the similar question before we, before we get into that. What, what, is, what, what, would, um, what would describe uh, Dr. McClatchy behind, behind the, uh, the scientist? Absolutely. So, uh, I am a Christian. I grew up in a, a Christian home, and uh, I uh, decided to uh, continue being a Christian um, past the age of being able to make my own mind up about such things because I was persuaded by the public evidence that Christianity is objectively true. Um, I was, um, I, uh, outside of academia, my interests include uh, things like chess. Um, I've done a lot of uh, chess tournaments, and uh, I, I used to be very competitive. Uh, I haven't played in a tournament for a little while now because I've been so busy with my university work. I just finished my PhD studies um, at Newcastle University. And uh, I, I also like music. I'll, I'll share with you my, my favorite song. is probably In Christ Alone. Uh, I um, got married also in April uh, to my, my wife, Katarina, who's here with us uh, this evening. And uh, um, we currently live in Boston, Massachusetts, where I teach biology. 
Uh, it's beautiful there. Um, my wife and I had the privilege of going up to uh, Maine during the fall to see some of the autumn foliage, which is uh, really, really spectacular. Um, I also enjoy uh, some outdoor activities like kayaking and so forth. So that's just a little summary of some of my interests. Fantastic. If you want to know any more about um, Dr. McClatchy, then I'm sure he'll be available at the end for a, a separate Q&A regarding that. Um, f f finally, before we move on to the, uh, the big question that we're here gathered for tonight, um, I would just like to ask, um, what has, Jonathan, you, you've mentioned about um, your upbringing as a, you know, in, in your Christian family, the, the things that have driven you to your beliefs now, to your worldview now, what would you say, would you echo what you've just said, um, or is there anything else to add? Yeah, so I, uh, as I said, I'm a Christian because I'm persuaded by the public evidence that Christianity is objectively true. Uh, I am a biologist by training. Uh, I was often bewildered and baffled during my uh, undergraduate years and subsequent graduate years at how anyone could go through a four-year university program in the natural sciences, especially the life sciences, and come out an atheist at the other end because the evidence for theism seems to be so uh, compelling, the evidence of design in nature. Uh, during my undergraduate years, I also began to interact with people of different worldview persuasions, people of different perspectives on faith, including Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. I had a, a good friend who was a Taoist. And, uh, that, and so it became very interesting to me of how can we know Christianity is true and, uh, and also providing uh, critiques of alternative uh, worldview systems. Um, and so I've uh, sought to, so I'm very, 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 very passionate about truth. Uh, I really care about believing true things. Uh, I do not want to dedicate my life to something that's false. And so I've really tried to do my due diligence in pursuing uh, the evidences uh, for and against Christianity. I've tried to hear out the, the best, the most erudite, the most robust uh, scholarly critiques of the Christian faith that I'm able to find. Fantastic. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, in terms of um, that uh, question, um, Dr. Atkins, is that, is that what you shared earlier? Is that kind of uh, enough, what you shared in that same question? Well, yes. I'm, I, being a scientist, at least I have to pre pretend to be open-minded. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I shall try to carry that through this evening, although I must admit that I have seen no evidence whatsoever for you call it Christianity I thought we were talking about God mm. which I which I yes. hope will be yes. broader than just Christianity mm. and so certainly if evidence came forth that encouraged me to believe that there was a God I currently think it would be because I had gone mad I would certainly not find it convincing. It, I'm sure that in the course of this evening we'll discover the evidence that really has caused you to travel the path that you have. Although I would strongly suggest, and of course we've agreed to be um, polite to each other this evening, um, <laughs> although I'm not sure I can sustain that for a whole hour. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, I've, got to, a, I've got a one, timer on. Yes, one has to worry, one, at least wonder, about the, the cultural conditioning that you were subjected to as a child, which you have carried on into the late, your middle years. And I suspect that the reason why you found evidence in favour of the existence of God is that you were, in fact, predisposed. Jonathan, do you want to come back to that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things I'd say here. Uh, one is that we've just heard what's called the genetic fallacy, which is where you, where you dismiss the reason someone has for their belief system on the basis of where that belief originated from. So um, I could just as easily say that uh, Peter Atkins is an atheist because of something horrible that happened to him in his life. That may or may not be true, I don't know. But that wouldn't have anything to do with the reasons he has for being an atheist. And so uh, there's a logical fallacy at play there. Secondly, um, uh, Dr. Atkins said that uh, there's no evidence for the existence of God. I would uh, challenge him to be more nuanced 
in his definition of words? I mean, does he mean there's absolutely no evidence, or does he merely mean there's insufficient evidence for I God? Think, I think that brings us to a perfect point where, uh, at the start of this conversation, um, it'd be great just to uh, clarify what we mean by certain terms. Um, so um, we'll go through a few terms, and maybe you can both share um, what your view and, and kind of term understanding is on that. So um, it may seem very, very basic, but it's very important um, at the start. Um, so in terms of different terms, um, if we were to look at the term evolution, mm -hmm. do you want to just maybe share what you believe about that? And, and sure, absolutely. So evolution uh, is kind of a slippery word. I mean, it has a number of different connotations. It can simply mean the change in allele frequencies in a population over time. An allele is a gene variant, uh, and it can refer to the process of speciation, where due to environmental factors, varying environmental factors, one population differentiates into two daughter species that are no longer able to interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Uh, it can also refer to the idea that uh, of uh, genetic mutations that occur in the population, which, uh, which is one important component of the, th the, of the theory of evolution. Uh, of course, Charles Darwin uh, didn't know what uh, mutations were. He talked about uh, variations in the population. Uh, we now understand that uh, these variations arise due to copying mistakes in the genome. As the DNA polymerase, which is a copying enzyme, is copying along, sometimes there's an incorrect letter uh, in incorporated into the DNA code, and that's a genetic mutation. And, uh, mo and most often, the mutation is neutral. It has neither a positive nor negative uh, impact on the organism's fitness. Uh, in very many cases, it's also deleterious, uh, which means that it's harmful to the organism and actually is um, disadvantageous to carry that mutation. And uh, in a very minority of cases, it's actually beneficial. And you've heard of antibiotic resistance and insecticide resistance and so forth. Um, and so, um, so the r genetic mutations are random. They occur irrespective of the environment, without respect to the environment. Natural selection is a non-random survival, deferential survival, where the, the fittest organisms uh, uh, are able to reproduce, are able to reach reproductive age, and so pass on their genes, their gene variants, to the next generation. And so um, it's, a, it's random mutation coupled with non-random survival. Right, could, I, could I just ask for the sake of clarity? Yeah. You do not deny evolution. Uh, what do you mean by evolution? What you've just told us. Okay. So um, I think that there's a, a strong case to be made for common descent. I think you can make a good argument for that. On the question of the sufficiency of natural selection and random genetic mutation, I think that it's demonstrably insufficient to explain the complexity and design of life so, that we see. Right, so you believe in intelligent design? Correct. That's one point that people should remember, I think. Uh, so you also believe that there is some teleological purpose in what you call evolution? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think it's very important to get those two ludicrous positions established as your starting point. But I was being polite. No, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. And do you want to share your your um, aspect of that, or are you? Have no, to I agree entirely. But uh, but evolution occurs solely without purpose, and is simply a working out of opportunities, and the. Uh, phenomenological evolution, looking at fossil, the fossil record and so on, is augmented quite independently by the molecular record as well. And it's quite extraordinary how these two great streams of understanding, that of the phenomenology of digging up bones and fitting them into a sequence, and then going into the molecular basis of it and finding that that sequence is in accord with the phenomenological sequence yeah. uh, confirms that evolution occurs, that natural selection is, broadly speaking, the mechanism of evolution, and that there is no purpose in evolution. So you've only, you've only pointed to the veracity of the pattern of descent with modification. So uh, another important ingredient of the theory of evolution is the idea of um, descent with modification, the idea that all organisms alive on the planet, uh, you, a giraffe, uh, a kangaroo, the fungus growing on the back of your foot, they're all descended with modification from common ancestors, eventually going back, if you wind the table of life far back enough, to a single universal progenitor of life that's the common ancestor of all life that we see. Um, 
for the purpose of our debate this evening, I'm not even contesting the proposition of common ancestry. I'm, I'm questioning the sufficiency of natural selection and chance mutation to explain the complexity yeah. and design of life. I, that's correct. I understand that entirely, but um, you're, you are imposing the answer on the question, and your answer is intelligent design and some teleological sense of purpose. So I'm not imposing the answer on the question. Rather, I'm looking at the scientific evidence and drawing design as my conclusion from looking at the data. Yeah, OK. I'm prepared to accept no, that. But, but I, I think it's very important for the audience to know that you are not a real scientist. What did you say? <laughs> so, sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry, my, my politeness has snapped. Um, um, it is very important for the audience to know that you are not a real scientist. And why do you say that? Because you believe in nonsense. And you believe in, um, in purposes that are beyond the evidence. Well, why, why don't we, why don't yeah. we um, move on to the next term? We'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to that. Um, I'm, we'll, sure we'll, I'm sure we'll have uh, some rebuttals in, in the, the next few, uh, few minutes. But if we just focus on um, the, next, um, the next term, uh, a true belief, how would you come to a true belief, um, Peter? True belief? Oh, you, I'm not sure I want to support true belief anyway, except insofar as I believe that science gets it right in time. Um, by, and the great power of science arises from the fact that it gets it wrong. Uh, that science progresses by making all sorts of mistakes and gradually, we believe, homing in on what is the actual mechanism of the universe. And I use that term advisedly, the mechanism of the universe. There is nothing beyond mechanism in the universe. And it is science's ability to, to discover what that mechanism is in all its wonderful intricacy that um, is, I think, the, what science achieves. So you would say that that is based on evidence that science is Oh, of course it's based on out. evidence. Yeah. Uh, uh, look at, but uh, uh, science is not just an evidence-collecting process. Science is the ability to reflect upon the evidence and to um, set it into a series of theories that where they overlap, they augment. Unlike religion, where religion, re religious attitudes, where they overlap, Islam, Christianity, and so on, are in conflict. Where science's various tributaries run into this wonderful ocean of understanding, they augment. So in order to understand um, events on a cosmic scale, cosmology, the origin of the universe, what's going to happen to it, where it's going, how it's getting there. You, the things on the very big scale, you need also to draw on information from the very tiny scale, the, the, the behavior of fundamental particles, the fundamental forces, and so on. Um, in order to understand biology, you need to understand chemistry. And they are not ever in conflict. Where whatever flows in through these various rivers of understanding in the sciences, they mingle and support. Mm. Quite the opposite of what happens in religion. Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that, or you just want to? Yeah. So, um, in terms of defining truth, truth is that which corresponds to reality, right? So. Uh, 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 that I mean, we can access truth by means of looking at the scientific evidence, and there's other disciplines of evidence as well, not just scientific evidence. There's also historiographical evidence. There's philosophical argument. Uh, for example, science cannot demonstrate uh, moral truths, moral propositions. Yes, it can. But go ahead. It can? Uh, I, I will dispute that so, later. Okay, so let me just finish then. So, I mean, uh, science can determine that if you put cyanide into your granny's tea, it'll kill her, but it cannot tell you whether it's moral to do so, right? Would you agree with that? No. No, you wouldn't. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, shall we discuss morality now, or do you want to come to it do later? You to, do you want to finish on evidence? Yeah. Okay, so... We'll move on uh, sure. So, um, uh, so uh, evidence is that which raises the probability of a proposition being true. 
right? So evidence, uh, uh, so something is defined as evidence, and this is where it's slightly technical, but I'll flesh out what I mean. Evidence is, um, ev evidence is defined as follows. The evidence E counts as evidence for your hypothesis H if and only if the probability of E is greater given your hypothesis than given the annulment of that hypothesis. So for instance, in a forensic science setting, um, the, uh, let's say that the, the forensic scientist comes forward with a murder weapon and points out that the accused fingerprints are on the murder weapon. Well, that would be evidence for the guilt hypothesis over the hypothesis of non-guilt. It doesn't prove the guilt hypothesis, but it's evidence for it by virtue of the fact that it's far more probable on the guilt hypothesis than it is on the innocence hypothesis. And so that's how I define evidence. Um, and and um, so I'm a Bayesian, um, and that's how I, I think about the topic. Oh, I define evidence as stuff that you can measure, stuff that you can go out and touch, stuff that the world agrees on. I don't think it's just probably this or probably that. It might be something else. Evidence is hard. Evidence is out there to be discovered and measured. So when, when you say that evidence is hard, again, we have to be careful what we mean by that, because you can have weak evidence for a proposition that might be weak evidence, but it's still evidence. And I mean, Carl Sagan, many of you will have heard his famous dictum that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And a lot of skeptics, a lot of atheists, uh, mistakenly assume that what that means in practice is that you have to find a single piece of extraordinary, spectacular evidence, and that would be sufficient, uh, and that would be necessary to have confidence in the God proposition or in the propositions of Christianity, etc. That's completely false. What can be accomplished with a single spectacular piece of evidence can, in principle, be accomplished with numerous pieces of weak evidence, because the, 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 the strengths of the evidences multiply together. And so if you have lots and lots of weak evidence, it, it ends up being a massive cumulative argument for the veracity of your proposition. Do you have anything to say on that, Peter? I, I don't understand this concept of weak evidence. It's either evidence or not evidence. Um, give me an example of weak evidence in science. And if you want to choose biology, then do so. But so um, I, I can give you an example yeah. of extraordinary um, transition that depends upon strong evidence. After all, the, the, in, the inception of quantum theory, one of the great discoveries of the early 20th century, was based upon serious, careful, scrutinized evidence on electromagnetic radiation, among other things. The other great intellectual transformation, which also therefore required major um, support, serious evidence, was relativity, of course. And that also was obtained by careful, accumulated, serious measurements. Mm -hmm. So the great trans... And, and go back to evolution. I mean, uh, 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 Darwin's theory of natural selection um, emerged from his detailed study of the evidence of um, speciation in, let's call it the Galapagos in general. Um, so all these great transformations of understanding, of which there, I think, are only three in the world so far, um, quantum theory, relativity, and evolution, all sp sprang from detailed, careful, accumulated worldwide measurement. And that's exactly my point, because you have detailed, accumulative measurements, right? One of those measurements on its own would not be sufficient to establish your hypothesis, but when you have multiple cumulative pieces of evidence, then you have sufficient evidence to, to be confident. But in none of them was weak evidence. All of them were parts of evidence that collectively were strong. I don't understand this weak evidence. Collectively strong, yes, it, it but individually not, be, not. It might not be convincing evidence. Yeah. But I don't think you should call it weak evidence. Okay, I mean, it's, it's a spectrum. You have, yeah. So it's a matter of terms there, but we, right. we're on the Yeah, but the terms evidence. are important. That's important, uh, right. And it's convincing evidence or not convincing evidence, uh, not weak evidence or strong evidence. Okay. Would you agree with that? Um, I, you, you, have, uh, you, you can make a convincing case with lots of pieces of weak evidence. Um, so I guess we would have to beg to differ on that. Okay, let's move on to uh, morality. Peter, do you want to share a bit about... Um, Oh, yeah. um, I mean, the existence of God is often proposed 
as an explanation of um, a moral stance. And I imagine you might, I'm not going to promote that idea, but I imagine that you would like to promote that idea, that you know, without a god, um, we are um, a, a rudderless boat in a tossing storm. Never turn your back on an atheist sort of approach. But I think to understand the origins of morality, <coughs> you, you have to look at our ethological history, our evolutionary history, and realize that ways of behaving have emerged because those ways give rise in a kind of natural selection way to um, stable societies. If you'd chosen a, a morality that said, eat all your firstborn, then you, know, you wouldn't get a very stable society. But tendering and fostering your firstborn does give you a, a, a stable society. So I think the, the ultimate roots of morality are not God and not heaven forbid, if I can use the term, the good books and all the horrors that they promote, but in fact are the way that we as humans have emerged through our evolutionary and ethological history. Jonathan, do you have anything to add from your de yeah. definition? Yeah, so um, the merits or validity of the moral argument rests really on the individual's view on whether ethics are objective or subjective. If you think that ethics are subjective, then I don't think the moral argument is going to be very convincing to you. If you, on the other hand, think that ethics are objective, if you think it's, if it, if you think it's objectively wrong or objectively true to state that Adolf Hitler was wrong to uh, facilitate the, the Holocaust, then I think that it's very difficult to say that on, um, without um, assuming a moral standard above and beyond yourself to which everyone's accountable irrespective of opinion. Um, however, I think, it's, I think the weakness of the moral argument uh, is that if, if, the, if the interlocutor you're talking to does not believe in objective morality, I think it's very difficult to demonstrate that empirically. So um, I think the moral argument is one of the, the weaker arguments for God, but I, but I think uh, if you assume objective morality, I think it's very difficult to ground that uh, as an atheist. Well, there's, there's more evidence that God is evil than he is good, I think. So maybe you should uh, construct an argument in favor of God based upon evil behavior, not, not good behavior. Look at the terrors of the savannah and the terrors of the ocean and the terrors of the prairies. I mean, a loving God would not have allowed evolution to take place in the way that it has. So, so do you believe that morality is objective or subjective? Um, I believe it's of, of um, a, a historical residue. But do you believe it's objective or subjective? I don't know. Not quite sure that I understand the terms. Okay. But I do think that it's um, uh, um, a, a consequence of our inherent nature. So you... And the, the discovery of intellectual niches, if you like, which enables societies to prop uh, propagate and survive. So do you believe that... Hitler didn't occupied a niche which turned out not to be very successful. Right, so you believe that Hitler was just unsuccessful but you wouldn't say he was immoral, right? Well, I, I'm happy to use shorthand terms like the word immoral, um, but only as a kind of portmanteau term for what I've been talking about. I, I, I think you know, terms like that are so easy to use in conversation, but you really do have to unpick them in order to know exactly what you mean. So why don't you explain to us what you mean by immoral? But, what do you mean by immoral? Oh, um, something contrary to what our evolutionary history has led us to. I think, I, mean, you know, I need to think a bit more okay. about that, but so, I think that's a start. So in some alternative view on evolution, then Adolf Hitler was actually morally virtuous. Say that again. So in some alternative scenario of evolution, then Adolf Hitler could in principle have been morally virtuous by his actions. Well, I don't think alternative e questions of evolution come into existence because there have been none and there can be none. Okay. 
So uh, then let's talk of, in hypotheticals. I think we have to talk about the way that you know, humanity has got to where it has through the process of unguided okay. uh, evolution. So, so one, one final question, then we can move on. One so, final one. Um, if the consensus of cultures today believe that the Holocaust was morally virtuous, would that still, would, would the Holocaust be moral or immoral, on your view? Oh, um, it would be moral in the sense that by some quirk of hypothetical evolution, which I do not, to which I will not subscribe, um, it was discovered that holocausts stabilize societies. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for your views on, on those topics, uh, guys. We're going to now, um, well, we've already begun the conversation. Um, but we're going to now continue through, and what I'd love to do, guys, is just um, hear from you um, some further opening thoughts on the on the um, on the topic. Um, one one thing that we talked about um, over dinner beforehand was um, was the question that is often asked um, at the end of um, at the end of these um, these conversations, which is um, what would you, what would have to change to what would have to be the evidence that would be provided that would change your mind um, from your view of theism and your view of atheism. Um, and it'd be interesting just to hear your thoughts on if there was anything that would change your mind. Um, it could just be very simple, but if there's anything, then um, we'd love to hear that now, and then we can then move into the, the, the big question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter, would you like to go, go first? Sure. Well, as I alluded to in the, my opening remarks, I think um, if there was evidence that convinced me that there was a God, it, I would have to realize that I had gone mad. I don't think, um, I, I mean, it's, it's an extreme position, and maybe you, you think that it's a non-scientific um, position to adopt, but I think the, um, f f I would have to think that I had been, if it was a, if it was a miracle, for example, um, then I would have to think that I had misinterpreted it, uh, or simply had gone mad in some some, some, some way or other. Um, I, I don't think there can be any evidence, and this is a very strong position, and I realize it's a strong position. I, I don't think there can be any evidence that would convince me. Okay, that's a very strong thing. Would you then say that you don't trust, um, you, you then distrust your mind in that? Yeah, exactly. something? You uh, distrust I, your mind, basically. Yeah, I, I, I think I've gone, I've gone potty. So you lack faith for your mind? <laughs> No would that, would that, that be fair question. to say? No, that's, um, that's too cheap. Okay, too cheap. <laughs> or should I say, you lack superstition for your mind? Uh, superstition does not convince me. Superstition is at the core of religion, and that's what we're arguing against. Great. Jonathan, do you want to share what would, um, yep. what would have to be the case to, to change your mind? So my view is entirely evidence-based, right? I am a Christian because and only because I am persuaded that it is actually true. So if the evidence were completely different, then my confidence would be different in the truth of Christianity. So, uh, and if we were to remove parts of the evidence for Christianity, then my confidence would correspondingly decline. So for example, if it were to come to pass that science were to demonstrate in the future that the universe actually had no beginning, it's eternal in the past, that would undermine my confidence in the God proposition. Or if it turned out that um, the more we discovered, the less fine-tuned the universe appeared to be, if there were less constants that appeared to be fine-tuned uh, for life to exist, then my confidence would also decline. Actually, it happens that the reverse is true, that over time, more and more constants and parameters of the universe turn out to totally be Totally untrue. Totally untrue. Um, so, I mean, that's the problem with biologists with respect, whereas I don't understand biology, I think you probably don't understand physics, but then we can maybe agree on that. <laughs> but, Peter, but, did you, but, should we just let Jonathan finish? Yeah, yeah. sure. Finish and, then we'll and then we can start the... Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, so, uh, if, it, uh, if there was good evidence that Jesus did not exist, that, of course, would undermine my confidence greatly in Christianity, that it would totally falsify Christianity. And I think, in principle, you could make an argument for that. Some have attempted to do so, such as Richard Carrier, whom I've debated, and others such as Robert Price and so forth. Um, so, yeah, uh, my, my view um, is entirely driven by evidence, and if the evidence that I believe supports my view were shown to my satisfaction to be uh, uh, wrong, 
uh, then I would have to revise my confidence in Christianity. And there are even certain things that would completely falsify it, such as if you could make a convincing argument that Jesus didn't exist or something like that. When you say um, satisfy your own position and your view, like how, how far would someone have to go to, you know, to, to prove that? To, uh, to falsify it. Yeah, so, so surely, you... Surely, if, surely it's just if it's just your feeling <laughs> yeah. and based on you, how far would someone have to go? So usually, um, I mean, talk about, I'll, talk, I'll talk about scientific theories for just a moment and I'll apply it to worldviews. Scientific theories, um, scientific paradigms, usually are not overturned by a single falsifying piece of data, right? Usually, uh, you know, the, the, single, the single piece of data that seems to contradict a, a theory or paradigm is usually uh, understood to be an anomaly, right? Something that's just a, an outlier. Um, it takes uh, a long time before data accumulates and eventually uh, the, the theory is overwhelmed by an avalanche of contradictory data and you have to revise your, your paradigm. I think the same is true in, in worldviews. Uh, I don't think that for the mo in most cases, I mean I can think of some spectacular examples where th there would be an exception, but in most cases I think that uh, my, my, my belief in Christianity could not be overturned by a single anomalous piece of data. Um, it's, a, it's a cumulative thing where you have lots of um, con conflicting pieces of evidence that would um, um, form a, a, an avalanche of, of, uh, that would go against Christianity and eventually uh, falsify it and completely reduce my confidence in it. So. I, think there's a, if I, may say so, I think there's an asymmetry in the kind of answers that we're giving here. Okay. Um, see, I think, in principle, I could disabuse you of your belief in God by rational argument, by sh taking you through all the scientific evidence which accumulates to show that um, there is no need for a god. Okay? I can't prove that there is no god, but I think I can deploy rational arguments to show that there is no need one. God is not a necessary concept. Mm. Whereas for you to convince me the other way, You've got to make me discard my rationality and accept evidence that I think highly questionable, that evidence like, I presume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, you know, the evidence from the Gospels written getting on for a century after the events that they describe and things like that. So there's an asymmetry here. I think given time on a desert island, I could convince you by rational argument, whereas you would have to disabuse me of rational thought to take your position. Okay. That's a very interesting picture in my mind yeah. um, that's been set up there. I think, I think where, where we are, what would be great to, we, we've both shared what would, um, what would dethrone our views. Um, what I think would be great to go through now would be to, to share, um, Jonathan and Peter, if you could share um, the three um, best evidences against um, your um, against theism for you, and then for theism um, for you, Jonathan. Right. So, um, Jonathan, do, do you want to start? Absolutely. Um, just share. Sure. Is that right, Peter? Jonathan, Fine, start? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so if we, we keep it keep yeah. it fluent. Yeah. So, and that actually uh, segues quite nicely into one of the responses that I have to Peter Atkins' argument, and in, in the last uh, section, was he said that God is unnecessary, and the arguments that I would make for God don't entail that, that God is necessary. My argument is that God is the best explanation, and that is different from being necessary. Uh, so that's an important distinction I would make. Now, um, in terms of my top three arguments that I will, I'll make tonight, um, I'll start with my own area of expertise, which is biology. Um, since, uh, uh, so the DNA molecule, which is uh, the information storage uh, molecule in the cell, is literally chock full of digitally encoded information content. Uh, in 1957, Francis Crick first proposed that chemicals called bases along the, the sugar phosphate backbone or the spine of the DNA molecule function as uh, alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a machine code. Uh, these, uh, these, are, these, these chemical subunits are represented by the alphabetic characters A, C, T, and G, and they determine the sequential, sequential arrangement of amino acid subunits which form, the, which, which form proteins. And the, uh, the uh, chemical properties of the side chains of those amino acid subunits determines how the protein will collapse into its three-dimensional structure in order to fulfill some job in the cell. It might form part of a biochemical pathway or 
a molecular machine or something like that. Uh, information content, and especially when found in a digital form, is habitually associated in every other realm of experience with conscious activity, intelligent design. And so when we, uh, uh, w when we look at a, a newspaper headline or um, uh, um, computer programming script or what have you, information always finds its source with an intelligent cause. Uh, and when we look at the DNA molecule, we find that sort of information. And so the best explanation, I would argue, is that it too arose by virtue of an intelligent cause. And this is based on the standard uh, principles of the scientific method, the historical method. It's called the abductive method. And it was pioneered by uh, a famed geologist uh, called Charles Lyell. And uh, basically, it can be summed up as that the present is the key to the past, or the, um, the method of inferring to the best explanation from multiple competing hypotheses. Uh, so when we, uh, when we want to explain events in the remote past, we let our present experience of cause and effect guide our search for that best explanation. And when it comes to information content, we know of only one type of cause, one category of explanation that is known to produce that type of effect. And that, that causes intelligence. So that would be one argument. Uh, should we take them in turn? Because it's, it's, That's my first point. Yes. Yeah, no, 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 I just want to comment on, sure. on, on, on that one, not, not to add mine, yeah, which, will be, which will be different. Um, you are presenting an in, wholly inappropriate version of what you mean by information. The DNA molecule certainly conveys information, but it has ac acquired information simply by accident. Sometimes the accident results in disease, in which case the organism fails. In other cases, the accident results in an enhanced ability to go on to procreate and so on, in which case the organism succeeds and proliferates and we get evolution. So there is no such thing as a priori information in DNA. It is simply a structure that has explored different sequences, some of which work, some of which don't, and the ones which do lead to you and me. And therefore, in no sense do they a priori contain information. It's only retrospectively that they, we see that they do. So it's quite wrong to think that there is a guiding principle for the emergence of the current structure of all our various DNAs. Mm. I'll just come back on that. What would you say to that, Joel? Yeah. So let me just first define what I mean by information. So I would define information as follows. That to qualify as information, it, your, your structure has to have two properties. One is complexity, and I'll define what I mean by that. By complexity, I mean that it has to be improbable, and improbable to the extent that it exhausts available probabilistic resources. But right? not impossible. OK, let me finish. Not impossible, correct, I agree. So, um, so it exhausts available probabilistic resources. The second criteria is that it has what's called specification. In other words, it conforms to some independently given pattern. So um, for example, what separates? No, because it works. OK, let me, let me finish, and then, and no, then but come back. I think it's very important for me, if you're going to present this complex <laughs> argument, and you're making a wrong statement at each point, then I think it's quite reasonable for me to say, that's wrong, that's okay. wrong, that's wrong. I didn't wrong, interrupt you when you were responding. No, but, so I, let me, but please do. OK, <laughs> let, let, let me finish. So um, let, to give an analogy, uh, if you imagine the difference be between um, a random uh, rock formation and Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, where you have the faces of four US presidents chiseled into the cliff face. Uh, we instinctively recognize that the latter is a product of design, not wind and erosion, because it's not only complex, the, the other cliff faces, the other rock formation is complex as well, but it also conforms to some independently given pattern. It contains specification. Likewise, language is not only immensely improbable, but it also, can convey, it also has a semiotic dimension. It conveys meaning, it communicates. Um, and so that's what I mean by, by information in the sense I'm using it here. Now, um, when it comes to uh, the origins of uh, information, and, and uh, Professor Atkins made a, uh, had a response to that, um, he talked about genetic mutations and, and so forth. 
Um, sure. That first point is that it doesn't explain the origins of the genetic information in the first place. I mean, it's generally thought that RNA is the first genetic material to have arisen on Earth. Uh, you have to explain the, the origins of the first don't, RNA polymers don't, and don't, the sequence. Don't confuse, of... don't confuse questions. We're talking not about the, the origins of life. We're talking about the propagation of life. Okay, so I, in my argument, actually was talking about the origins of the first information. But we can talk about the propagation of life if you want as well. So I, I, I could even make that in my second argument. Um, Should we stick to the first argument? Yeah, yeah, yeah then, sure. Uh, do you want to come back, Peter, on that? Um, no, except I, uh, Mount Rushmore did not arrive by natural selection. So the analogy is totally irrelevant. So, I mean, what, so nat natural selection ensures the survival of the fittest, but not the arrival of the fittest. It does not have, it does not explain genetic innovations. For that, you only have random uh, genetic mutation, yeah. no, right? Accident explains genetic modification. Things go wrong, and things go wrong sometimes in extraordinarily helpful ways. That you know, things went wrong in the first common whatever um, uh, um, ancestor. Uh, but th the thing that went wrong, for many of them, they were wiped out because it didn't work anymore. But at least one of them, it went jolly well right, and they got more elaborate. And they became you know, unicellular and then multicellular organisms and so on. So it all proceeds by accident. And, it, and to say that there is um, that uh, DNA has acquired information is only right in retrospect, not a priori. So how would you explain uh, the origins of protein structures that require... Um, so um, uh, Douglas Axe, I don't know if you're familiar with his work in the Journal of Molecular Biology and subsequent work, um, where he's t looked at particular protein structures uh, such as beta-lactamase, for example, which is an enzyme that confers antibiotic resistance to certain bacteria. And uh, he, uh, he basically conducted what's called a site-directed mutagenesis experiment, where he sought to investigate what is the ratio of stable and functional protein structures within the vast array of combinatorial possibilities. In an amino acid polypeptide, amino acid chain of 150 amino acids, you have a 20 raised to the power of 150 of possible ways of arranging those amino acids. Yeah. Now, many of those are, are gib many of those are gibberish, and many of the, and some of those are functional. Um, Doug Axe sought to calculate and estimate the ratio. Um, so he basically estimated that the ratio of stable and functional protein structures within combinatorial space is of the order of one part in ten to the seventy fourth power, no. which is an astronomical totally, rarity. Totally irrelevant. These atoms did not come together to give you a particular pro a pr a protein molecule all in one go. That protein molecule slowly emerged through the ages by gradual growth, some of which was successful, some of which was unsuccessful. And in the end, you got a viable, effective enzyme. It's, your argument is the same as you can't build a, a the old-fashioned argument. You can't expect to get a 747 by a gale blowing through a junkyard. That's, what, that's the kind of argument you're currently deploying. Take into account evolution, its slow, careful, and usually wrong steps. Not teleological, usually wrong. And out of it, Comes something successful in there. If your protein doesn't even fold, that's not much help. I mean, <laughs> well, no, it's not true. I mean, I remember seeing an article on the evolution of the mouse trap. Um, I mean, I, this is less technical than your own language is. But the mouse trap, someone took the mouse trap and gradually took it apart, um, removing bits and pieces of it, and found that as they went back in gradually dismantling it, you know, they bar that comes across the spring, the bit of cheese, and so on. As they gradually dismantled it, it got less and less effective. So going forwards, the mousetrap effectively evolved into the effective killing machine that it is today. It's exactly what happens with, um, uh, with evolution of biological systems, but there is no guidance to it. So, so let's... Uh, let, let's I'll take one more example. Point, final we'll, point, yeah, final point and then move on to Dr. first point. Um, okay, so let's take a biological example. Um, let's take DNA replication. Now, DNA replication is interesting because natural selection to operate requires a self-replicating molecule. 
and it requires variation. Otherwise, natural selection cannot even get off the ground. So how then do we explain DNA replication without presupposing the, ver the existence of the very thing we're trying to explain? Now, what, what are some of the complexities involved in DNA replication? So we have the DNA helicase enzyme, which is involved in unwinding um, the, the DNA double helix to prepare for copying. We have the DNA polymerase, which replicates uh, each of the, the two strands of the DNA double helix, um, and it's, it's replicated in a semi-conservative way, so both of the strands become uh, a, the parent of the next molecule. Uh, we have um, the primase to synthesize an RNA primer because the DNA polymerase cannot begin on its own. Um, we have um, the single-stranded binding proteins that stop the DNA double helix from reannealing itself and so forth. We have the topisomerase enzyme, which alleviates supercoiling um, upstream of the, of the DNA helicase. It's unwinding their supercoils that are induced, and the topisomerase basically um, is responsible for, for, for removing those supercoils um, and so forth. And so that's just a very simplistic sketch of some of the proteins involved in DNA replication. How do you explain that by a process lacking foresight? And foresight is indistinguishable We've, from design. It's through natural selection and it's through evolution. That explains everything. I mean, what doesn't it explain? You've, DNA replication. Nature has had four <laughs> billion years. For, nature has had four billion years of tinkering. Most of the time it got it wrong. But in these instances, it gradually got it right. And it didn't get it right in one go. It didn't build a 747 from the junkyard. It put bits and pieces together, found a wing, made a rudder, made an engine, and they sort of come, came together in some symbiotic, enhanced, life, literally life-enhancing way, and gradually we emerge. But natural selection has no foresight. Natural selection Absolutely. cannot look into the future no. and visualize a complex endpoint. No. Intelligence can, right? So how do you put, by natural selection, how do you put together a system requiring multiple cooperating components? Because it's by accident. You simply discover that some things work and some things don't. And then you, you say the things that work, oh, they must have been designed. Whereas I say the whole thing took place by accident. It, they, nature makes mistakes. It stumbles along all the time. Mm. But it's only the ability to replicate itself that magnifies what it has achieved that turns out to work. So That's all. There's nothing, there's no guidance, there's no end, end point. It is simply the tumbling in to viability. So we can conclude there that we're an accident. We're, we're lucky accidents. Lucky yeah. accidents. Yeah. Wow, well, that's, yeah. that's a, it's a, it's some, some very interesting yeah. insights from you both there. Yeah. Um, Dr. Atkins, would you like to share um, one of your um, uh, aspects? Uh? Ooh. Um, let me think. I think there really are only two serious questions that science needs to answer. There's lots of little ones, uh, like the detailed mechanism of replication, the origin of uh, sexual reproduction, for example, a serious problem, the eradication of disease, all those sorts of things. And I think it was a, certainly a malign god who decided that smallpox was fun. Um, but I think the, uh, the, uh, the two big questions that confronts humanity, by which I mean academic humanity, not general humanity. One is um, the origin of everything, and the other is our ability to contemplate everything. So in effect, it's uh, cosmogenesis on the one hand, and understanding the nature of consciousness on the other. And science is really edging forwards to understanding both. Now, there are lazy ways of understanding cosmogenesis, um, which is to say, for example, that God did it. And that seems to satisfy a lot of people. Might even satisfy you, I don't know. Um, but it seems to me that that's a particularly lazy way of approaching an answer to one of the greatest questions of, of the intellect, as it were. But what science is doing is gradually edging towards the moment of inception of the universe. And look at the progress that it has made in the past 300 years, ever since it started to apply mathematics to observation and to effectively to build modern physics. 
Um, and I think it is only pessimism that thinks that science will not cross that final barrier and understand how that inception took place. And people are already sort of thinking about it in a variety of ways. But to lie back now, to give up at this point in the evolution of our comprehension of the world and say, oh yeah, God must have done it. I mean, God is the lazy man's explanation for things they don't understand. If they can't understand it, they say, well, God must have done it. A scientist says, no, we're going to work on this and we're going to unite humanity's minds in the search for comprehension. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, Dr. Atkins, just before Jonathan comes back, would you then um, conclude from that that um, would you say that uh, you believe that all Christians have gone mad? Um, I, I, that, that may not be too um, repugnant. Um, God, please let me not be too repugnant. Hold it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think. Or shall I even no, say no, no, people no, with let, another worldview? Let, let me squirm a little on the end of that pin um, by saying that I think a scientist cannot be a true scientist and be religious at the same time. How about that for a sort of semi invasion of it? This, intending to goad you, of course. Okay. So, did, did you receive that? Uh, so <laughs> so um, Francis Collins, who directed the Human Genome Project, you think he's not a real scientist. Is that, is that what I heard? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, now, it, it seems well, to me that, it, that it's rather unscientific and self-serving to define what answers are possible and what answers are permissible before you investigate the question. I mean, that sounds completely anti-scientific and anti-intellectual to me. Oh, I think that, that, I think that this is a very important point. I think that there are two classes of questions, of great questions, which is what we're talking about. There are two classes of great questions. One are real great questions, and one are false great questions. And I think false, uh, f real great questions are questions based upon evidence, uh, and for which there is evidence that they need an answer, as it were. I can say it that way. Whereas false questions, which um, are just propagations of um, uh, self, um, of wishful thinking. Um, now, science deals with the first of those questions, the real questions. Religion, in my view, deals with all the false questions. Um, and I don't mind you wasting your time doing wasting your time on false questions, but don't think it convinces me that they're important. False questions include, um, is there a God? Um, um, but we're here it, tonight it, discussing it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so why are you here? I, I tend to be self-referential. <laughs> um, is there an afterlife? A false question. Um, things like that. Okay. And so basically the questions that um, religion gets tied up in and, and kills people if they're heretics. Um, uh, are false questions. And the real questions are scientific questions. Okay. Would you posit that, um, Dr. Dr. Atkins, to, um, we've talked, we're obviously talking here about Christianity, the God of Christianity, but in terms of other, other world religions, you know, um, his, Oh, I was talking about God. Well. Yeah, well, well, are, you, are you kind I, of branching I, that over I, them all? I um, thought we were talking about God, not these little East, Middle Eastern sects which grew up, perhaps because there was someone called Joshua who came to be called Jesus. Not an uncommon name in the in year dot. Um, and certainly, you know, maybe there were certainly stories built up around him which makes him sound like a really nice chap. Um, but I, I don't think there are any more than that. And it's quite extraordinary that, it? that, that, they've, that such fables have propagated. Um, so sci uh, scientists with other world views, um, what would you say to them? Well, there's no such thing. Well, scientists with other view, world views, you mean Buddhists and, and, and Islamists, and, you know, they're all the same, tarred with the same brush. I mean, to, to base your understanding on superstition, 
seems to be the denial of the scientific procedure. And you, excuse me for pointing, you um, um, base your worldview on superstition, so you're not a real scientist. Okay, so I, I have a few comments uh, on that. Um, you said that conclusion of design in the world is lazy as a scientific hypothesis. You said that's lazy. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Suppose that I have a degree in forensic science, okay? So suppose that we were forensic scientists and we we're going to investigate a, a fire. And the two hypotheses that are on the table are this was an accidental fire or this is the result of arson. Someone deliberately set the place ablaze. Let's suppose that the evidence indicates that this, is, this fire was a result of arson. Would you turn to me and say, no, Jonathan, that's lazy. That's a lazy hypothesis to conclude that this is the product of arson. I, I don't see the point where this is lazy. Because when it comes to design in the realm of biology, you accuse me of being lazy for inferring based on evidence yeah, but that there's design. Yeah, but this is entirely different. I mean, that's the trouble with arguing by analogy, that arson and... Um, Accidents, let's call it that, uh, are not consequences of natural natural selection. I mean, they are acts done by possibly a criminal. So, I mean, it's an analogy which is too far removed but from what we're there talking are, about. There are none do you believe in miracles? Yes, I do. You see, no scientist. So you believe in? Except for me, I'm a scientist, right? <laughs> I mean, no, stop saying so no scientist you, you because I'm a scientist. You you believe in the suspension of the laws of nature. Um, I believe that there are. Um, in, I, I believe that God interacts with nature. I believe that. Uh, answer that the there question. Are, there Do are, you believe that the laws of nature are suspended I, by the action? By I, I, I believe that miracles um, are um, violate the regularities of nature. Right. So there's singularities yeah. that violate the regularities. No, no, of nature. no. Don't wriggle. Don't wriggle. You have to accept that a miracle is a denial of the laws of nature. I believe, as I said, that they viol there are violations of the regularities of nature. They're singularities. Uh, so you, you think that, for example, um, that the, the law of the conservation of energy um, could quite happily be um, um, evaded by the finger of God. I think God, God is the creator of the universe. I don't see why that's a problem. You see, that's why he's not a scientist. I mean, there are these great laws of nature which govern the way we behave, and not one deviation from them has ever been observed, except by people whose testimony we cannot believe. I mean, that's David Hume's argument, that, that, that no miracle of ever actually occurred, because there's always more reason to disbelieve the veracity of the reporter than of the, of the actual taking place of the event. Um, I mean, these chaps in the Vatican who say that, yeah, he's a saint because there was a miracle and someone got cured, they're charlatans. The problem with your argument is... Aren't they, are they charlatans? The, the, the physicians who have to verify that uh, um, a miracle has so, taken place by intercession of a saint. So I, I can't speak to them because I've not gone and investigated. But you're happy, the, you're happy that miracles probably happen. Yeah, I, th I think there are charlatans half who claim to, to perform half a dozen miracles. times a sure. year. No, no I, I think there are charlatans who claim to perform miracles. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the problem with David Hume's argument, there's actually lots of problems with David Hume's argument. One of the problems with it is that it's circular because it assumes that all the miracle reports in the world are false. Well, they are. Um, and that's the whole thing that the argument's trying to establish. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, but, so, but no, 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 no. So it's no, circular. That's a lack of evidence. Don't, don't twist it. What, what, what Hume's argument says is that all the evidence is false. So, um, and that's not the same. So Craig Keener wrote, is a, um, Craig Keener wrote a two volume set on the topic of miracle claims. And he documented hundreds upon hundreds of claims around the world that miracles have occurred. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not vouching for them all being true. I don't know. But they are claims. And for David Hume's argument to work, he has to assume that all of those hundreds upon hundreds of miracle claims in the world are false. But that's the very thing he's trying to establish. 
And so the argument ends up being circular. No, he there's didn't say that. He said that there's always more reason to disbelieve the reporter in those cases. And is, and it is, is not know. the same thing as saying, I disbelieve the miracle. Okay. Do, do you accept that, in principle, anything with a non-zero prior probability, that's anything that's logically possible, can, in principle, be demonstrated if you have sufficient evidence for it? Uh, well, I'm not sure what that in principle means. I don't think, for example, casting out spirits into the Gadarene sparks wine is um, something that you probably believe in. I, I'm not vouching for do the you? truth of all supernatural claims. Do you, do, I'm saying do, you, that in do you think that Jesus cast out the madness into the Gadarene swine? I do. Well, I think that sort of summarizes credibility in, in, in one sentence. But are you, I mean, I'm the one here making arguments. You're the one making bold assertions without yeah, any evidence. But how, how can a scientist believe that such an event which misunderstands the nature of psychotic illness think that that is even a possibility, let alone a probability? Um, well, it may be a small probability. No, we're talking about possibilities. Do you think it is possible that it is poss that um, mental illness can be transferred from a man to a pig? So I would reject that the guy's problem was mental illness. It was demon possession. So, yeah. So you think it can be transmitted to a pig? Um, demon possession, obviously. Well, let me save a lot of money for the National Health Service if we could do that. Well, I think we should move on to the next question now. Um, Peter, do, do you want to make, the, your, make your second uh, point? Would you like to make a second point? Because um, oh, um, you had two points you wanted to make. Did I? Jonathan well, I'll first. make up the second one. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 did, I did say that I, I think the, um, the, the, there were two major outstanding problems for science to solve, as well as countless little ones. Mm. Um, so I'm not, I'm not being exclusive. One of them is, as I mentioned, the nature of consciousness. Mm. And I think um, we, the, whereas understanding cosmogenesis would involve mathematics if, in the broadest sense and the proposition of th theories about the fabric of reality, I think our understanding of consciousness and all that it entails, including aesthetics and morality, um, will come from simulating it. And so I think um, you can see that over the past 50 years, um, we have gradually progressed in our ability to build machines which sort of give the impression, of, in some cases, of thinking. And in due course, I see no reason why they won't become... Um, self-aware and I think being self-aware is probably the, 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 the groundwork of, of consciousness mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? And whether, and whether those machines will believe in God um, that's a second question of course they might think that the man who made the machine is the God So I'm highly sceptical that artificial intelligence will ever acquire conscious subjective experience. Um, there, I mean, yeah, you can describe the, I mean, if I prick my finger with a pin, you can describe all the physical processes um, by which that pain sensation is transferred along the neurons and so forth. But I don't think that really explains the subjective experience of pain, right? There is, there is a conscious subjective experience which is internal to agents such as ourselves. We, are, we have what I would call insider knowledge because we are agents. We actually experience consciousness. And it seems to me to be properly basic to accept that uh, we have freedom of the will. We're not autom automatons, right? We're not deterministic. And that proposition of free will seems to be completely at odds with the idea that the mind and consciousness is completely reducible 
to the material constituents and components of the brain. Um, and so I'm, I'm inclined to be very skeptical. Um, I don't think that artificial intelligence will ever acquire conscious objective experience. You see, this is another difference between a religious believer and a scientist. Religious believers are pessimistic about the power of human comprehension. Scientists are optimistic about the power of human comprehension. We think that there's, if there's a problem out there, we're going to go out and solve it, and we're going to share with the rest of humanity our com the comprehension that we acquire. You religious believers don't want to understand effectively. You want God to be a secret. You want him to be out there, never understood, and you want us to ha hold him in awe. That I find, and, and that leads to pessimism, and the pessimism that our human brains, even working collectively, which they now do wonderfully, uh, that human brains are incapable of comprehension of ultimate questions. But answers to Dr. Jonathan, questions. would you say you're pessimistic, as, as Dr. Atkins was saying, about the, the development of human brain power? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I, there's positive evidence that consciousness is not something which can be fully explicable by, by, by natural law and by the material components of the brain. Um, I, I think that uh, free will presupposes uh, that we are free, that, we're, that, we're, that the mind is not fully reducible. Sure, it's dependent on the brain, but it's not fully reducible to the brain. Um, and, I mean, Peter Atkins, I think, uh, is assuming that I'm, I'm making kind of God of the gaps type arguments, where I'm arguing not based on what we do know about the cause and effect structure of the world, but what we don't know. And I think that may be what's giving rise to his charge uh, that I'm being pessimistic. Whereas really what I'm doing is I'm making a positive inference, not based on what we don't know about the cause and effect structure of the world, but based on what we do know. Um, and I give the case from uh, the information content in biology, and that's a positive association from every realm of experience that information comes from intelligent causes. Um, but, and so it's a positive argument, not an argument. Yeah, argument. but you see, you're making the world too complicated. That's the whole point of God, is to make the world seem complicated. The whole point of science is to discover the simplicity that lies beneath the wonderful complexity of the world. We scientists are hewers of simplicity out of complexity. You want there to be an ultimate unknowable. We want there to be an ultimate knowable. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that, Jonathan? Um, so, I, I mean, I, I gave the illustration earlier of uh, the forensic scientists investigating the arson. Uh, take another example. If an archaeologist were to discover a hieroglyphic inscription... Is this another analogy? Yeah. I mean, okay. it's to illustrate the fallacy in your, in, your, in your argument here. So, if we were to imagine that an archaeologist uncovers a hieroglyphic inscription in the desert someplace, um, would he be lazy in inferring this is, like, most plausibly the product of design, of intelligence? No, but the whole point about science is that it is not an island. It is a continent of concepts. And you can't say, oh, I think this happens in this particular island, and not encounter its ramifications on other islands in the, in the continent of islands, as it were. So science is an extraordinarily constrained intellectual construct, unlike religion. Anything goes in religion, frankly. You can make it up as you, being go, as you go along. I think you, I don't want this to appear insulting, uh, but well, maybe I do, but I, I hope it won't. <laughs> you, you can make up your side of the argument as you go along this evening, because God can do anything. So there's no constraint. God is an island. Whereas I, as a scientist, am heavily constrained by what we know to be true and the ramifications and interconnectedness, the reticulation, if you like, of concepts in science. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll may as well leave that for that question there. Jonathan, do you want to share your, um, Peter's shared two points, you've shared one so far. Do you want to share another point? Sure. And then um, we'll um, be closing off uh, this conversation in a few minutes. Sure. Um, 
Well, let's, let's, I mean, we've talked about the existence of God um, already. Um, let me give an argument that establishes or, point, or provides powerful evidence not only for the existence of God, but also specifically the truth of the God of the Bible. Um, and that would be the argument from the resurrection of Jesus. It didn't happen. Okay. Well, I, I think it did, and I think we have good evidence for it. So, um, the, the apostle, I mean, let, there, there's four contending hypotheses, which I, I would maintain are, are mutually exhaustive which purport to explain the rise of early Christianity, uh, why um, it came into being, why it took the very precise shape and structure that it did. Um, those four contending hypotheses are uh, the, the, the legend or myth hypothesis, namely that the apostles did not in fact claim Jesus had been raised from the dead, but the, the gospel accounts concerning the resurrection are later myths, and the disciples would have been as surprised as anyone else to hear that Jesus had been raised. The second hypothesis is um, what we might call the conspiracy hypothesis, which is that uh, the disciples lied about it and deliberately set out to deceive others into thinking Jesus rose from the dead. Another hypothesis is that the disciples were themselves honestly mistaken about the proposition that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Um, And finally, the hypothesis that I myself entertain, which is that Jesus, in fact, did rise from the dead, and that explains the rise of the early apostolic belief that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Um, There's the possibility he wasn't dead, of course. There is, but uh, that is universally um, rejected by scholars no, because of overwhelming not. evidence. No, it's not. I- I'm sorry, no, but not. maybe in a minute we can hear yeah. Peter's side well, of, of, course. Of, of, um, of his comeback on this. Do you want to just yeah. finish those points? Um, well, yeah, I'll finish. Um, so, in terms of the first hypothesis, uh, um, that the, the gospel resurrection accounts are later legends, um, we have overwhelming evidence that the apostles themselves claim Jesus rose from the dead. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 7, Paul passes on an oral creedal tradition which he most likely picked up in, in, in Jerusalem three years after his conversion is recounted in Galatians 1, where he meets with Peter and James, whom he mentions in this creed. Paul writes to the Corinthian Christians, what I received I pass on to you is of first importance, that Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, or Cephas, then to the twelve, then to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me, as to one untimely born. Um, and so most scholars are convinced that this is an oral creedal tradition that Paul's not himself come up with, but he's passing it on uh, from the Jerusalem leadership, in particular Peter, James, and the Twelve, and so forth. Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that the scholars are wrong on that. We can still show that the apostles claimed that Jesus rose from the dead from what Paul goes on to say next. He says, and last of all, he he appeared to me also as to one untimely born, for I am the least of the apostles, not even even worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, for in the contrary I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so he believed. And so he thus assumes that his proclamation of the resurrection is consistent with what's already been proclaimed to the Corinthians by uh, Peter, James, and the Twelve, the other apostles. And we have independent confirmation that the Corinthian Christians were acquainted with the preaching of the Apostle Peter, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul chides the Corinthians for having divisions among them. Some say, I follow Kephas, others Apollos, others I follow Paul, others I follow Christ. And so they were familiar with with Peter's preaching. It was called um, Kephas in Aramaic. So um, we can show then that the original apostles in fact claimed Jesus had been raised from the dead. It's not a later developing legend. So then that leaves us with um, the conspiracy hypothesis or the honest mistaken hypothesis. The conspiracy hypothesis, I think, is fraught with problems. I'll just give you one, and that is the fact that the disciples were willing to die for that belief. Um, And liars make poor martyrs. I mean, we have particular attestation for the martyrdom of James, the Lord's brother, and Jesus' close disciple, Peter. And I like to ask the skeptic, how much would it take to convince you that your elder brother was Yahweh of the Old Testament to the point of martyrdom? Something pretty radical. I mean, Flavius Josephus mentions the martyrdom of James, the brother of Jesus, who's not a Christian, but a Jewish scholar, a Jewish historian. Um... Finally, the honest mistaken hypothesis, Um, and that is um, that the disciples honestly came to believe Jesus had been raised from the dead, even though in fact he did not. Um, And that seems to me to be undermined substantially by the fact that the Gospels, which are grounded in apostolic eyewitness testimony, claim that the resurrection experiences were multi-sensory in nature, involving multiple sensory modes, not just sight, but group sightings, group conversations with Jesus, physical contact with Jesus, eating breakfast with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and so forth. That's, and according to Acts chapter 1, extended across 40 days. 
So it wasn't just one brief and confusing episode. And so that's something that's very difficult to be wrong about and be honestly mistaken. And so then I think the best hypothesis out of all those we've examined is in fact that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. That's it in a nutshell. It was all made up 70 years after the event. Uh, I'm, again, I'm, uh, I'm the one here that's been presenting evidence all throughout this, this conversation. Um, unfortunately, um, P- Peter, what would you say to some of the, um, some of the other historians, uh, you know, theologians and historians who, who uh, do agree that uh, Jesus was a man? There's just as many who disagree, I should think. No, there's no. I mean, I mean you're, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, uh, but it, depends, uh, it depends what you read. If you read theological literature, then yes, you, you're a club, you'll agree. Otherwise, if it didn't, if the resurrection didn't take place, you're all out of a job. Uh, whereas you know, we skeptics um, think that it was all made up. The simplest, if we go for simple explanations, we 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 think that that's the easy answer. And obviously, there are one or two historical resonances in the story. Pontius Pilate existed and things like that. But um, but even to believe that Jesus died is questioned. No, it's not. I'm sorry. You're just I'm, not I'm familiar with this field. It. So I've done extensive question. study in this field. Yeah. No, of course it's questioned. And he was on the cross for three hours. Normally when you're crucified, you, you hang around what, for two, three days? He was unconscious, maybe. He wasn't dead. But Jesus had also been severely flogged. And also in John, it's reported that the soldier thrust the spear into Jesus' side, and out come a flow of blood and water which, uh, which is um, thought by medical experts to be indicative of yeah, death. It shows the heart was still pumping, doesn't it? <laughs> so we, you would acknowledge that Jesus lived, um, but you just don't acknowledge that he died. That's, that's where you start. I don't know whether he died or not. I don't know whether the, there was... The, Ro- um, the Romans were uh, experts. Uh, uh, I, I think there's a serious people. question about the historic, historicity of Jesus. Um, I mean, um, definitely um, what um, scholar th- what? takes that view? What scholar in any reputable institution anywhere in the world takes that view? Oh, um, I, unlike you, I don't bother to read a great deal yeah. about this. But, I rest my case. But, but I read, I, uh, but, uh, but I, I do read, because I think it's a waste of time. But uh, I, I do read enough to know that there are doubts. And I'm sure that um, uh, you know, believing Christians, we've moved away from God believers to Christ well, this believers. is directly relevant to that topic because if, if oh, yeah, God raises no, from I'm the dead, not, God has to exist. I'm not, I mean, it's a it's a it's a subset of the of yeah. the big question. But I'm happy to to, to go along with you to believe a, uh, accounts that were written nearly a hundred years after the events took place, which are so either. so contrary to um, physiological possibilities. Uh, but not necessarily hallucinations or misapprehensions and so on. I can well be, I'm I'm happy to go along with the following story. That, okay, he was unconscious, half dead, almost dead, was taken down, recovered, um, tried to hide away, but was seen by the disciples. And by word of mouth, it was handed down that miraculously he'd come back from the dead. I don't think I'd go beyond that. So um, I have a few comments on that. Um, on, on the swoon theory, I mean, this is laughed out of court by historians. Even secular historians don't take this view seriously. Um, there's so many problems with it. I've already given uh, one or two. Um, another one is the Romans were experts at killing people. They really knew what they were doing. Because if you were a Roman centurion and you let someone get away, you let a condemned criminal get away, your life was forfeited in his place. You'd be on the cross instead. So um, a second point is that even assuming the swoon hypothesis, I mean, what is our theory purporting? Are we really suggesting that Jesus was in the tomb from a Friday till the Sunday morning with holes through his hands and feet and having been lashed very heavily by the, by the Roman flagrum, uh, the whip that Jesus was flogged with? And, uh, and we, we read in secular history that many people died just from the whip alone, just from that Roman flagrum alone. And then Jesus on the Sunday morning got up from the tomb having been flogged and having nails pierced through his hands and feet, rolled away the stone from the tomb, fought off the guards that were guarding the tomb, and marched down the road to the apostles to convince them that he'd now been raised from the dead to glory and immortality, and one day they'd receive a resurrection body just like his. Well, in those days, of course, um, tombs were not 
elaborate affairs. They were little caverns, dugouts uh, in the walls around Jerusalem. I reckon they forgot which one they put him in. I mean, it's a hypothesis. It's, it's a certainly hypothesis. Is. It is. It is a hypothesis, yeah. 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 Jonathan, do you have anything to say on that? And then we'll, we'll close yeah, this I mean, conversation. Yeah, Mark mentions that the women saw where Jesus was laid. And so. Uh, 100 years later, 70 years later. I, I'm sorry, but this is just. Do you want really to speak false. into that bit, yeah, Jonathan, about I mean, the, 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 this, the dating? Yeah. I mean, it's very important. I'm sorry, but these, this is these things, wrong. what you're basing your, your belief system on things that were written down uh, as propaganda. 70 years after the events okay. that they sought to propagandize. Okay, so, so Jesus died around 30 or 33 AD. And um, the, I mean, this, even, the sec, even the most liberal scholars would date the Gospel of Mark to around 70 AD, the Gospel of John between 1995 AD. Um, so, there, I mean, according to the most liberal dating, uh, Mark is, is approximately you know, 40 years after, after the event, so that's not 70 years. Furthermore, I mean, I think there's good evidence to date the Gospels earlier than that. Um, in fact, some scholars, I mean, Dan, Daniel Wallace, for example, even dates the Gospel of John to the 50s. Um, 20 years, okay. Yeah. We don't even get it right between Harry and Meghan. Yeah. I mean, let me finish. Um, so, um, I think there's good reason to think that the, the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, may be pre, are, are, are plausibly understood to be pre-60. For example, um, the Book of Acts, which is a companion volume to the Gospel of Luke, doesn't mention the destruction of the temple in AD 70, or the siege of Jerusalem in 66 to 70, or the great fire of, Ro of Rome in 64, or the ensuing persecution under Nero from 64 onwards, or the um, martyrdom of Paul or Peter or James, the brother of Jesus, and so forth, all of which you would expect to be there had it already transpired by that point. It ends on a cliffhanger in Acts, Paul is placed under house arrest, um, and so forth. Um, so the Gospel of Luke has to be even earlier than Acts, and then Luke is generally thought to be the last of the synoptic Gospels, which would put Matthew and Mark even earlier still. Um, but, we, but we have sources, I mean, the, the source I quoted in 1 Corinthians, the letter of 1 Corinthians was written from Ephesus by Paul, um, in, the mid, in the early to mid-50s AD, and uh, so, th so that's quite early, and then he's also, in that particular text I quoted, quoting from an earlier source, um, and so uh, this goes way back, and many scholars date that to within, you know, two or three years of the cross and burial and resurrection of Jesus, and so the, so, the sources so are So presumably earlier. you believe in the virgin birth as well? Yeah, I do. So, can you describe the nature of the DNA of Jesus? What component of it was God's, and what component was it was Well, it's, it's, it's a miraculous event, and if God can create the universe, then I'm sure that he can create the... You see, the, so gullible, you know, so chromosome. naive. Right? So you have to believe in absurdities in order to sustain your position. These are manifest absurdities. What if I was to say it's an absurdity to think that life can arise spontaneously by chance and necessity? Um, uh, what if I was to suggest that... Um, but it did. That is... <laughs> so it did arise, but it's you that's suggesting it arose by chance and necessity. So in my view, let's just say for the sake of argument, in my view, that's a preposterous view. Well, that's just a dismissal. I haven't actually provided any arguments at this point um, for that. So I would need to provide some evidences to establish it to be ridiculous, and you haven't done that. What about walking on water? Are you happy with that? Yeah, because it's a miracle. Have we got time to go through all the miracles? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, claim, the miracle claims. I think what we're going to do there, uh, gentlemen, is we're going to draw this time of conversation to an end, and then what we're going to do is have a, a few minutes break, and then we're going to come back for a Q&A. We've already had a lot of uh, questions coming through on the Twitter. I'd encourage you guys to um, get, get, uh, get asking the questions on the Twitter and not using the hashtag, and we will come back in 15 minutes um, for the uh, time of Q question and answer. So thank a round of applause for our, for our two guests this evening. <laughs>